I want to start in by really trying to go in deep and ask you a very important question. I know that today many of the infrastructures of government and even the private sector are built on the backs of IBM. IBM really was a company that shaped the modern era. But some people think that maybe this is not the case for the future, that you guys have lost it. I've heard a lot of great news about the new restructuring and things that you're doing. Please tell us what the future holds for IBM. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for that question. What you're reflecting on is so many of the world's retail banks, airline reservation systems, taxation systems, financial systems of all types are built on the back of IBM technology, both hardware and software. Now, over time, companies should evolve because if you don't evolve, just like a nation, you're going to become less relevant. And the change you're referring to, last November, we split the company into two pieces, IBM and Kindrel. So the IBM, the name, is focused on technology and consulting. 70% of the company is focused on high growth areas, areas like artificial intelligence, cybersecurity, cloud technologies. And the pieces that are still relevant, still very important, but belong in a different business model became a company, Kindrel. So being focused on growth, being focused on software and consulting, and being focused on where technology is going is really what IBM has become. So keeping up with the times, I think, is, is the right way to, to uh, conclude that. Uh, quantum computing is always described the doom and gloom kind of scenario, that it's going to come, it's going to break all the encryptions, and our current uh, digital lives are going to be disrupted. I know that IBM is doing a lot of work on crypto, uh, on uh, quantum, we'll go to crypto yeah. in a bit. Um, <laughs> what are you doing there? You know, how is the future of quantum going to be? Yeah, so quantum computing is often measured in this uh, thing called a qubit, as a quantum bit as opposed to a silicon or a digital bit. We have 127 qubit actual quantum computer working on our cloud. Anybody is welcome to go access it. So that tells you that the state has advanced quite a bit. The phrase I use, it's no longer science fiction because many people think of quantum like that. It's just science. Okay, so we have 127 qubit quantum computer. You can do problems around material science, around electric vehicle batteries, uh, maybe pricing arbitrage. And that and exists now? That really is good. now. I think in another two to three years, these problems will begin to have commercial impact, not just you're able to do them. But it's hard enough to do these that I think it takes a year or two to learn how to do it. Now to your encryption question. When we reach in the tens of thousands to a million qubits, somewhere in that range, and we are at 100 today, probably today's encryption will get broken. And that is something to worry about. Not only will today's encryption get broken if you've written something onto tape and stored it away, somebody may be able to come and break that also. But let's call it 10 years from now. So the way around that is to have quantum proof encryption. And this is not computationally harder than today's encryption. And this is something which must be embraced. One of the techniques we promote, we actually put the code out in open source, is called lattice-based encryption, as opposed to key-based encryption, which is uh, today's kind. But I would urge people who are worried about it, people who build their own telecommunication networks or data which should be kept private for more than a decade, it's probably appropriate to, to uh, do the other things. But it's not about to break right away. Let me also uh, assure people of that. So, so it's coming, but it's coming in a decade. Correct. Th that's the message. And, and I think that should scare us enough because you know, climate change, people have been warning about it for the last couple of decades and no one did anything about it. So hopefully you'll help us go to that. Yeah. Um, I, I want to ask you about a very important topic. I know that a lot of people, including myself, have watched Queen's Gambit. And we've seen how chess players were seen as the most intelligent and capable people in the world, and they were celebrated. And then you guys come along and create an artificial intelligence system called Deep Blue that completely obliterates the legendary world champion in chess. Where have you come since then? So 20 years ago, you showed us that you were able to you know, reinvent what artificial intelligence is. Right. Where are you in 2022? Right, so the step in the middle was taking it from techniques like playing chess, because I'll say playing games is important, but in the end it has less of an impact on our commercial lives. 
So then in the middle, we went to a question and answer, a very famous uh, game, mostly in the United States, but Jeopardy was its uh, name. But the goal there was to prove that a computer can be good at answering general purpose questions and answers. Then you fast forward to today, so that is about 10 years further on from winning Jeopardy, and I think we can begin to see the role of artificial intelligence all around us. Look, I fundamentally believe that we are not going to have enough skilled people on our planet in any country. So if you don't have enough skilled people, what is the technology that can help augment human productivity, that can really help scale, that can give you 10 times? You know, uh, if I think about an oil and gas plant, um, I'll be clear, I, I am a believer in hydrocarbons. I think that energy security implies we have to have those. But how do you build these plants in such a way that it's safe to operate? Maybe a robot has better eyes than a human. You don't really need a human to go do that. But now you have to have the back end looking at that and saying, is the valve in the right position? Are we running the plant correctly? If you're in a steel or a blast furnace, is this operating at the right temperatures? Can I save 7% of the energy that is being consumed? If I'm looking at oil and gas, can I maybe use less water? Can I become more efficient? Can I reduce the emissions in the production of the things itself? I think that AI is going to really infuse everything and we have to use it for enterprise purposes and for improving the lives of citizens. I'll also say AI has to be trusted. You cannot really give all your data to somebody who may misuse it for any purpose, but we won't go to the trust topic. But I fundamentally believe that artificial intelligence, and it shows, I mean, it shows in the seriousness with which the UE takes the topic with your title and your role. And I'm sure that goes into the underlying data as well, not just the artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence offers globally over $10 trillion of productivity. I think just for the UAE, if we were to measure it out to 2035, maybe 100 to $200 billion. If you think about a GDP increase, where do we get topics that can increase GDP by 10, 20, 30%? But we have to use it carefully, we have to harness it, we have to build the skills, we have to deploy it, and we have to deploy it locally, I believe, not just remotely. Sorry, very long answer no, no, I, I, to I your question. So to follow up on that, I know that you guys are doing a lot with Watson Healthcare, on healthcare. And you probably are global leaders in this space. Uh, many people are concerned about the um, bias dilemma. So how do you ensure that these systems are able to represent Everyone, look at the diversity of this room, right? You have people from many different ethnicities and backgrounds. How can I know that when it diagnoses me, that it understands that I am not a white Caucasian 40-year-old? Look, I'm going to take the topic wider than healthcare because the topic you raise is really, really important. So artificial intelligence learns from data. So you have a lot of historical data. Whatever has been digitized is going to go learn from that. The Problem with that is that if you have errors and biases in your historical data, AI will be able to reproduce your biases and your errors perfectly with actually greater speed and greater volume. That's not a good thing. So you gotta step back and you say, how do you avoid bias? How do you make sure that your AI is more ethical than maybe a set of homogeneous people who trained it? And to do that, you have to begin to look at and I say, but you have to be careful. You have to go out and look at. You should look at gender. You should look at age. You should look at ethnic background. There are 15 or 16 categories that I think are safe because neither should engineers and technologists take it upon themselves to go further to further a political agenda. So I will draw the line there. But there are techniques. You can watch how good the AI is. You can make sure by inserting artificial questions or decisions into it that you're not drifting from where you want to be. You want to be sure, for example, in your health example, that you diagnose men and women equally well. Maybe you diagnose 40-year-olds and 60-year-olds equally well. So you can begin to insert those test cases. You know, for the, for the few people who understand software in the room, you've got to have your test libraries. So Ditto and AI, you've got to watch it to make sure it's not drifting, because since AI learns, it could maybe drift away from what you want. But watching for ethics and watching to make sure that there is no bias, I'll just use that simple word, is really important. So, so let's make a prediction here. When do you think we'll be diagnosed by a IBM 
Watson healthcare agent uh, for, let's say, mainstream diseases, not, not the very acute. I think that diagnosis by an AI engine is going to be 10 years out. Ten the reason years. is very simple. We could have you and me. We could have maybe the same disease. So let's suppose an AI diagnoses us. But our instinct of what aggression we want in a treatment could be very different. Mm. So the human doctor, I think, is very, very important in that interface. So I think AI may become an assistant to the physician or the surgeon. AI is not going to replace the physician or surgeon for the next 10 years. Now, as we build more confidence in all this, over time, then maybe it becomes for very simple things. But right now, I think it will be an assistant to the, to the doctor, not a replacement. That would be my prediction for the next 10 years. So uh, I'm actually seeing a trend here. 10 years for quantum, 10 years for AI to take over diagnostics. So it looks like everything is coming to mature in, in 10 years. Oh, but in, <laughs> I think in robotics, in customer service, we did a great example. I mean, everybody, I'm sure even here in this audience, everybody suffered from COVID. Vaccinations offered a great relief. So when we worked in the US with some of the companies, we said, okay, people can call in for vaccinations, yeah. but everybody's health condition is different. Now that's a big, big cost of labor you've got to take on. We wrote a Watson engine that people said, this is what I am, and it could go ahead and schedule their appointments. Yeah. So there you can begin to. So it's not giving you the injection, but it is scheduling the injection yeah. for you with a human. So that's today, here and now. If I begin to look at order taking, I think AI is ready to go ahead and do that now. Mm. I think making a life easier with so many enterprise and consumer speech to text interfaces, I think is here and now. So I think it's upon us. Uh, we at IBM internally use AI a lot for helping our people do HR tasks, human resources tasks, move an employee, promote an employee, somebody ready, do an assessment. Those are all things that we do internally today. The reason why those two cases I take and put them a bit away, anything that impacts life and death, as the EU, I think, in its scale from one to four, said those are level four. Mm. Level four things I think we should be more careful of always. You know, so self-driving cars, uh, uh, medical diagnosis, I think, uh, can impact human life. Those I put further away. Other things, let's go do them now. Let's scale, let's experiment. That makes a lot of sense. I think the logic is solid here. Um, I, I wanted to ask you, since you mentioned self-driving cars, we're seeing a new model when it comes to starting companies. In the past, you had software providers and you had hardware providers. And there were businesses built on software. There were businesses built on hardware. And there were businesses that just combined the two, but actually were, were procurers, right? They would actually buy the software or buy the hardware and combine it. You then have someone like Elon Musk, who goes and creates the car, uh, programs the software, and also does a distribution, right? It's a new business model altogether. Does that in any way threaten the industry that you play in? Do you think that people are going to opt to become you know, more or less able yeah. to do everything themselves? No, I think both these models have always existed. So one, I'll use the word vertically integrated. I'm basically taking very raw materials and do everything in the company itself. If the end product is something that delights people, that model can work. You know, we certainly have a few. I mean, I would put Apple in the same category. It uh, brings in raw materials and produces a finished product, and it's very, very popular. Elon Musk's companies are very popular. He does a great task of helping you understand how to take cost out, because sometimes by using lots and lots of sub-assemblies from people, the total cost adds up to where it's prohibitive. The other side, people do hardware and software. But if I'm going in to help an enterprise improve its operations, they're not going to accept that we come in, rip everything out, and replace it with something from IBM. They'll say, I'm okay if you come in and improve my ERP. I'm okay if you improve my supply chain. So I think both have a role to play. And I think especially when it comes to consumer gadgets, maybe the vertically integrated, as long as it's delightful and at lower cost. You've got to have both has a role to play, but I think for governments and enterprises, it tends to be more peace parts because it's not greenfield. In a car, you throw away, or you sell your old car, you buy a new car. It's hard in a government to say, let's throw away the government and get a new one. That's not gonna happen. Absolutely, Leg legacy infrastructure is always a challenge. Yeah. So I want to end with a final question that's um, more related to the UAE. I know that you're an alumni of the IIT. 
which is one of the best technology universities that graduates tech talent globally. IIT recently announced through a partnership between the UAE and India that they're going to expand out of India for the first time in their history to the UAE. How do you think it's going to change the talent pool? How do you think it's going to change the economy? What impacts do you foresee in that decision? Look, I'm a really proud alumni of the IITs. And if I look at the impact it has made both in India and outside, there are so many tech companies that are run, but there are also so many IIT graduates in government within India. If I look on that and if I look upon the sheer hallmark of an excellent engineering education, I think it's hard to beat an IIT. And so as long as you stick to the highly selective admission, the really tough grading, the rigorous curricula, I think it's going to really create a set of talent here in the UAE that is remarkable and that will allow you to really uplift your economy. I know you believe in technology. I know you believe technology has to be one of the pillars of advancing the economy. What better way to create that than an IIT physically in the UAE? So hopefully in the near future, the next CEO of IBM will be a graduate of IIT Dubai. Thank I look you. forward to that. Thank you very much for your time. It's been a great conversation. And I look forward to seeing you around the venue and attending the other sessions. Thank you all for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency.